I was going to go for a run, but um, on the basis of this, I think I'll stay indoors and do some modelling. Hello there, welcome back, and welcome to part 87 in my build log series of the Trumpeter 1 to 200 scale model of the Titanic. Now, today I am sort of doing an odds and sodsy kind of video. Um, my sort of basis of modelling over the last few weeks has been to try to get everything finished except for the rigging and the ship's flags, because I think both of those deserve a video in their own right. Uh, so I'm going to do separate videos in each of those. Uh, but today's video is pretty much going to try to capture every single other thing that was done on the ship, except those two aspects. So uh, I'm fitting coaling out riggers today, uh, I'm fitting the ship's sounding spars, I'm fitting the 25 foot cutters, uh, I'm fitting the sort of additional rigging that was used to secure those cutters down. Um, I'm also going to do any sort of little light touchings up with paint brushes and stuff where, you know, things have been knocked or perhaps the paint doesn't quite look as good as it should. Um, what else am I doing? I think that's probably about it. But, you know, I'm just sort of trying to capture all those little things that I've missed up to now. Um, and with that in mind, and as I've said repeatedly, um, if you do see things that you think I've missed, if there's a bench missing, or if you think there's a, I don't know, if you think there's a, a sign that should be there which isn't, or whatever, if you see these things, do just let me know, because um, there's a lot of stuff going on behind me, and it is quite tricky to keep track of all this different stuff. So if you see something you think I've missed, give me a shout, and I'll address it. So without any further ado, let's crack on. So as you'll have just have seen in that time lapse, I've now added my coaling jibs along the side of the ship. Uh, now what are these used for? Well, let's have a think. Titanic was a ship that used coal as its primary source of fuel to get across the Atlantic. Now coal, of course, was stored in boiler rooms here, 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 and here. All six of the boiler rooms will have had multiple coal bunkers which stored coal which could be fed into the boilers whenever necessary to keep the steam up and to keep the engines turning. Now loading coal, the process of coaling, was a really horrible process, absolutely disgusting process. Dust got everywhere, it was vile. Um, but nonetheless it had to be done because it was the only method of getting these ships across the Atlantic. And so these ports here, these are actually little cutouts in the hull. Uh, and these were used to funnel coal into the ship. So behind these ports, there's essentially a free access into the coal bunkers for each of the boiler rooms. Nice and simple. And the ship's carpenter, when the coaling was done, would come up and make sure all of these were secured, ready for the voyage. So coaling would start with a coal bunker coming alongside. Then these outriggers would be swung out of the ship, lines attached, and these would be used so that carts with coal could be pulled up the side of the ship and poured down into those coal ports. And that was how the ship was coaled. If Titanic had come around maybe five or six years later than she did, you may well not have seen these, because by sort of ooh, 1917, 1918, coal was actually rather going out of fashion. It was a perfectly decent source of fuel, but physically loading it into ships took days. The coaling process could quite easily take two days. Um, really restrictive, you know, all the time that that ship spends in port being cold, it's not earning you money taking passengers across the sea. So coaling was really, really costly for that. Um, and so many ship owners decided instead to convert their ships to burning oil instead. Oil was a more expensive fuel, but you could simply attach a pipe and pump it into the ship and 
refueling would take a matter of hours rather than a matter of days. So if Titanic had come along a bit later, you may well not have seen these outriggers on the side of the ship. However, she was built and completed in 1912, so she had them. Now, I've deliberately left doing these until quite late on in the build, not because they're tricky or because of anything like that, but it's just because they're a little bit vulnerable on the side. I was a bit worried that you, know, you might sort of snag things on them and rip them off. So I thought if I left them till quite late on, their chance of survival would be maximised. So there we go, another little job done. Now then, you may remember when I first built all of my lifeboats, I also built the 25-foot cutter boats. These are boats one and two. Uh, but I didn't fit them to the model because, of course, these boats were swung out of the side of the ship. They were essentially always uncovered, always ready to go in the event of an emergency. Person overboard, something like that. Uh, so I never fitted these to the model because I was just a bit worried that, you know, me sort of gesticulating or something might smash them off uh, and cause them damage. They're quite a vulnerable thing, you know. So I wanted to leave them until later on in the build, uh, which, as it turned out, was a good thing. Because, as you can see, these were fitted with grab lines. Uh, and I fitted them with grab lines because I honestly thought that they had them. But when I, did, when I posted my video, um, another channel, uh, whose name is Titanic, um, commented and said, are you aware that the 25 foot cutters didn't actually have grab lines. Uh, and initially I will admit that I was pretty skeptical about that because I sort of assumed that all of the boats would, you know, it's a fairly standard part of a lifeboat to have grab lines on them. But um, I checked on photos of Titanic and I checked on photos of the lifeboats after the disaster when they were moored in New York Harbor. And they're absolutely correct. There were no grab lines fitted to the 25 foot cutters. So I removed them. Unfortunately, however, my reasonably heavy use of glue has left some marks behind. Now, fortunately, I actually have a second set of 25 foot cutters. So I made some new ones. And as you can see, they are nigh on identical. I've just added a few oars into these ones instead, because of course these boats, as I say, they were ready to go at a moment's notice. So oars are in place and they do actually really make the thing pop you know it makes it look a bit more sort of a bit ready for action you know uh, but the salient point of this story is I now need to go ahead and add all of my decals back on to these boats so um, thank you uh, Titanic for letting me know that I've made a mistake there and this shows as I, as I keep saying in my videos please let me know if I've made a mistake this shows the absolute benefit of that because without someone telling me I would have fitted the lifeboats with crab lines and it would have been wrong and at some point in the future somebody would have said or I'd have realized and it would have annoyed me much better that people give me a shout out and just say look I think you made a mistake here even if you're not sure give me a shout out it's always better to do that so thank you very much Titanic I will now fit my decals
So quite a lot of modelling there. Um, what I've been doing is fitting the 25 foot cutters. Uh, pretty challenging because you have to actually suspend them via the davits. Um, you'll notice as well what I've done is I actually glued the side of the boat to the gunnel of the ship uh, and that just makes the entire assembly far far more rigid um, which is of course desirable if your model is going to be sort of going places and subject to a bit more wear and tear. In addition, I've also fitted the two soundings bars. Uh, these were bits of equipment that were used to measure the depth of water in ports. They were normally stowed uh, just alongside the second lifeboat, port and starboard, uh, but they could be swung out of the side of the ship. Um, famously, on the night of the sinking, the soundings bar, I think on the port side, had to be chopped away with an axe because it got in the way of loading one of the boats. So they've been fitted as well now. Now, one of the last jobs that remains to me on this model is adding some of the navigation lights. Now, I've already done two of those. I've already done the port and starboard lights on either side of the bridge. But Titanic also had another two navigation lights, one on the foremast and one right on the aft of the poop deck, actually mounted on the rails right at the very stern of the ship. So, these lights need to be a little bit brighter than the average light on board ship. For obvious reasons, they need to be seen from further away. They're navigation lights. They're lights that are designed to be seen by other ships in the area. So, because of that, I need to sort of rejig how I'm arranging my circuits somewhat. So, just to go over this again, this is the lighting circuit I used for all of my miniature LEDs. So you can see I've got a resistor, 300 ohm resistor, and then four LEDs in series. And the way this works is that the resistor essentially eats up 4.5 volts and each of the LEDs sees around 1.75 volts and that cumulatively gives us the 11.5 volts that the circuit is supplied with. Now, my batteries do give out 12 volts, you're correct, but remember there's a power supply in between the batteries and all of my lights which takes the voltage down to 11.5 volts. So. That's how it works, and I deliberately specified that resistor to be 300 ohms in order to limit the voltage across the remaining LEDs to 1.75 volts. But we can do the same thing again with a different value of resistor in this circuit. This is going to be my navigation light circuit, so as you can see, it still gets 11.5 volts and still finishes up at 0 volts. But instead of having four LEDs in the chain this time, we're only going to have one. Now, what you've got to bear in mind, therefore, is that we can't use the same value of resistor. Because if we use that value of resistor, all that's going to happen is this LED is going to see far too much voltage and it's going to pop. And that would be very sad. So we need to do a little bit of maths to work out what size this resistor needs to be to protect the LED sufficiently that it will be on and be bright, but it won't burn out. So. We need to use our trusty equation, V equals IR, um, and in this case we know that the voltage we're supplied with is 11.5 volts. So V equals 11.5. We know I as well, because this LED uses 11, sorry, no it doesn't, it uses 15 milliamps. So we know our current, and we now need to work out the resistance. But this plugging in these numbers won't quite work, because that these numbers essentially work for the entire circuit. And what we need to do is just focus on this resistor. So basically, what I need to do is I need to decide how much voltage I want to flow, or I want to use across my LED. And what I've decided, just by plugging an LED into the power supply, is that I want this LED to see... 2.8 volts, which means I want the remainder of the voltage to go across this resistor. Okay, now if my maths is correct, that means that we want to see 8.7 volts used up across this resistor. Add those together and you should end up with 11.5. 
So what we're going to do to essentially remove this LED from the circuit, we're going to take our starting voltage, which is 11.5, and we're going to remove the voltage that we want on the LED, 2.8, and that gives us 8.7 volts. So we now plug this number and our current into our equation. So V equals IR, but we can also say that V divided by I equals R. And if we plug these numbers in, 8.7 divided by 15 times 10 to the minus 3, which is 15 milliamps, and that leaves us with, I'm just going to plug this into the calculator now, 8.7 divided by 15 times 10 to the minus 3, and that gives us 580 ohms. Here you go, and as you can see I've got the power supply up and we are just pumping out whatever we're pumping out, 11.5 volts. And as you can see, we've got a genuinely very bright light, which is just what we want. So the circuit is just positive end of the LED into the positive supply, out the LED, through the resistor, and back to zero volts. Um, now, this is where the, um, the world of idealism meets the real world, because in reality, um, I calculated I needed a 580 ohm resistor. Um, resistors tend to be made in pretty standardised values, and if you think about that, that makes a lot of sense, because people use resistors anything from 10 ohms all the way up to several hundred mega ohms. So to make every single possible resistance value is not only ridiculous, it's also practically impossible. So um, resistors tend to be made in standardised numbers, so I've gone for the closest value that I can find, uh, and this seems to work really well. Right, navigation lights. Uh, for those who didn't know, Titanic had a navigation light right on her aft, right here. And as you can see, or maybe you can't see, depends if I can focus the camera, we now have an LED right there which is reasonably well disguised. I've put a brass backing on it. Um, I've painted the wires uh, and that then disappears onto the underside of my poop deck. And those are the two wires coming out there. Now you'll notice that the two wires come out right in the point where there's the little retainer here. So what I've done is I've cut a notch in the retainer so that when I shove the poop deck in place, we don't strip the wires and wreck the circuit. So I've tested it and it works. I just now need to clear up the circuit, chop off any excess wire, that kind of stuff, then put the poop deck down for good. So here we go. And yes, I appreciate the sun is shining quite bright today. So the lights are reasonably hard to see, but as you can see, the nav light is markedly brighter than the standard deck lighting, uh, which is exactly what I want, because this is, they, they would have been brighter. They wouldn't be bright by modern standards, of course, because we're still using pretty old fashioned bulb technology here, but they would have been markedly brighter than anything else. Uh, I'm just sort of turning around so you can get an idea of what we've done. Uh, I did put a sort of brass covering on the back of that light, so very little of the light is actually shining backwards. The only light that is shining backwards is the stuff that's sort of bouncing off the railing. The vast majority of this light is shining backwards. And that's sort of the idea. Um, the idea of navigation lights is that they can only be seen from certain angles. So people on other ships are aware of what direction the ship they're observing is pointing in. Uh, so that's kind of the idea. So, as you can see, um, this is a sort of good exercise in using resistor values to A, define how bright your lights are and to protect LEDs. So that was quite a good little bit of work. I'm very happy with it. I now just need to do the nav light on the foremast. And for that reason, the foremast has been removed so I can try to fit one. Uh, and that'll be the end of the nav lights. So for the forward nav light, it was a bit of a challenge because um, the mast really sticks up completely on its own. Um, so there's not that many places where you can hide wires. Uh, I'll go into exactly how I've done it in just a sec, but as you can see, there is a hole for the wires drilled down into the forecastle deck, and there is a shot of the wires coming out the bottom of the forward mast. 
Now, by far and away, the lights that I've struggled most with on this model is this one here, which is the forward navigation light, probably about two thirds of the way up the forward mast. Um, and the reason it is challenging is because there's just nowhere to hide. Uh, there's nowhere where you can hide the wires leading up to the mast. Um, so I've used masts from the KA add-on set, and these are solid brass, so they're not hollow. I can't, I couldn't run wires up the inside. Um, there are other alternatives. The mast that comes in the trumpeter kit is plastic, and you could probably drill a hole up that if you're very accurate. Um, but they're not hollow to start with. Uh, China 3D also do um, a mast for this, and I believe there's a mast available on Shapeways as well. Um, and certainly masts made out of softer materials, you could probably cut a, a trench along the side of the mast and run your cables in there. Um, and that would be a way of achieving the, uh, the result. Um, but whatever way you do it, it's incredibly challenging because of course, you know, the mast just sticks right up ahead of the ship. Uh, and you know, lighting has been challenging across the whole model. Uh, normally because, you know, you're jamming things into tight spaces, like with the, um, the port and starboard running lights, you know, you're sort of jamming a lot of wires into a very, very small area, or, you know, you're sort of locking circuits away in rooms that you can't access again. But this was certainly the one that's been most troublesome to me. Um, now, I've thought of several different ways of getting this to work. Um, the first was simply to have an LED there and sort of run the wires down the mast, paint them the same colour as the mast, disguise them as best you could, uh, and then drill a hole into the deck. Bob's your uncle. Nice and simple and fairly effective, reasonably effective. Um, and incidentally, that is the method I've gone for, and I'll explain why in just a moment. But there's a couple of other methods I've thought of. Um, another method I've thought of was to use that there were bits of rigging that came up from here and over here up to the mast. And I did think briefly, could I make those rigging pieces the wires for the LED? Uh, and that was a fairly, that was a fairly attractive idea. But the reason I've not done that is because look, this mast is securely glued down, but even so, because it's so long, it moves fully a centimeter, fully 10 millimeters. And I just think even with even with me lifting up the model carefully, I think these wires would snap um, because they are very in order to look realistic. They have to be extremely fine. And I just think they'd break very, very quickly. So if that was a, if this was a model that was standing on a bench and never moving again, that would have been a really nice option. But because this has to move, I just I just don't think it will last. Um, another idea that I'd really liked and um, I, I was sort of tempted to try was to use the metal of the mast as a conductor. So as I say, this mast is made of brass and brass is a pretty, pretty good conductor. And I thought, could I perhaps run the electricity up to the bulb through the mast and then just have a single wire going back down into the ship. That way you half the number of wires you've got to disguise and it all looks a little bit more composed. Uh, now that probably would work. Uh, it didn't work for me because I haven't soldered this mass together. I've glued it together. I think if you soldered it together, you might have a decent stab at getting that to work. Sadly, I didn't. Um, but again, <sighs> it probably would work, but I think it would be a little bit, I don't know how much better it would be than the solution I've come up with. So the solution I've come up with is simply to have an LED there with wires running down. Now I'll just turn on the model's lighting and we can see what this looks like and then I'll show you some photos of the cable run and you can make up your own opinion on how well disguised it is. So here we go. As you can see we've got a nice mast headlight there. It's nice and bright and it's, it's certainly a lot brighter than the other lights on the ship. And again, that's exactly what we want because um, these are navigation lights. They have to be brighter than the rest of the lighting on the ship. So that is absolutely tip top, spot on, bada bing, bada boom. I'm so sorry, but that's, that's exactly what we want. Um, you'll also notice that into the bargain, I've turned off the lights that were on the folks hall deck on the front. I don't think they'd have been on. So I've, um, I've just cut the supply to them. 
so they are now off. But here we go. That's how it works. So uh, feast your eyes on that and I will now take some photos and you can have a look at the cable runs and make your own mind up on how good a job I've done. So here we go. Um, for the first portion of the run, from the LED downwards, the, ma the wires are hidden underneath the access ladder. Um, for the next section, they just sort of swizzle round about 90 degrees, and then for the last part of the run, down to the actual deck, the wires are hidden behind the cargo derrick. Um, so they're fairly well hidden, and of course they are now painted the same colour as the rest of the mast. Um, the other thing I've done, though, which seemed logical to me, is to put them on the other side of the mast to the side of the ship that is normally visible. So um, <clears throat> on my stand, uh, the ship is displayed showing its port side. Uh, so I've hidden the wires on the starboard side. Uh, the logic being that the vast majority of the time uh, you won't see them just because of the nature of how I choose to display the ship. So there we go. That's your lot for this episode. That's pretty much all of the additional modelling done now. Uh, the only real remaining tasks are, of course, rigging and flags, which will be in two separate videos, hopefully coming pretty soon. Um, just one note, as always, um, it's slightly frustrating, but the the way that this my, my camera works, it always seems to make the lights look a lot whiter than they actually are, certainly on the two night photos I just showed before. Um, the lights, particularly on A-deck at the front, look very white, uh, and the reality is they are a lot more yellow than that um, on the actual model, where, you know, viewed by, by eye, they're a lot more yellow. Uh, it just proves very difficult to get, a, to get um, a camera that actually recreates that correctly. Anyway, there we are, some good jobs done. Um, if you've enjoyed this video, do please like and subscribe. Um, if you've got any questions or comments, do pop them down below and I'll do my best to get back to you. Um, I'm very happy with how this mast has turned out. Certainly, it's one of those things that will, um, it'll keep me sort of happy for a long time, knowing how much time and effort went into actually getting that light in such an obscure part of the model. So um, that's always quite, a, it's always quite satisfying. Um, so that's it for this video. Um, so as I say, if you've got any questions or comments, pop them down below and I'll do my best to get back to you. And I will see you in the next one. Bye for now.